you've just got to be more like the All Blacks. <laughs> Excuse me. He loves he he loves rugby. He's an absolute rugby. I think growing up in Bath, you can't not. And uh, I was like, what 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 do you mean? He's just like the All Blacks. Just never look at their competition. They don't worry themselves with statistics or how well anyone else is doing. They just concentrate on their own game and being the best that they can be. Be more All Blacks. This week, I'm delighted to share with you an interview with Florence from Petalon. Florence shares her small business journey, but we also touch on what she did prior to Petalon and how her last role before setting up Petalon really helped her with the concepts and ideas she had with Petalon. We discuss the many ups and downs, um, highs and lows of running a small business. And what I love about Florence is she's so transparent with sharing her struggles as well as the high points. And she's really found the perfect balance when it comes to sharing her story of her and her family's business. So we chat a lot about the time that Petalon was in London and then we move on to Petalon moving to Cornwall, which happened last year. And Florence also discusses her, the amazing community of clients that they have, many of them who are repeat clients and many of them who are um, women. And she also discusses the crowdfunding and how amazing the uptake was from the um, female um, audience that she has. We talk about British flowers. We talk about Florence and her husband James is... Um, now plans to grow flowers in Cornwall and how they now decided to call it field flowers that particular aspect of their offering then at the end of the interview Florence shares her three tips as if all the nuggets she's given you throughout the interview weren't enough there are three more at the end which I'm sure you'll find really useful so I hope you enjoy the episode A very warm welcome, Florence. It seems, I, well, I can't remember the last time I saw you. I think it was British Flowers Week about five years ago. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm fine. I'm so excited to speak to you and hear about your amazing transition from London to, I'm very jealous, Cornwall. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start off with um, the beginning of your flower journey because that is over seven years ago I think so if you'd like to yeah how it all started please so um it started with a dodgy bunch of flowers that my um <laughs> that my now husband James sent to uh, my boss at the time uh, I was working in sales and she was in cahoots with James and said I had a sales training day in King's Cross on my birthday um, James was like, oh, well, well, we'll just go get some breakfast first. But he'd secretly got me onto the Eurostar and we went to Paris for my birthday, which was so lovely. Aww. And his thank you to her for sort of lying to me was um, was to get her a bunch of flowers. But when I saw them on her desk, they just, um, uh, they just didn't really convey how thankful he was. But for someone of his means at that time, he was never going to spend, you know, over 50 quid on a small gesture of thanks. And so we started to think about, oh, okay, well, how could you get flowers delivered that maybe didn't cost that much or, you know, you didn't have a minimum spend with a florist. And um, and so we sort of started looking at, at what was available or what we could actually do. Um, and at the time, James had started a bike building business. And so one thing we had lots of was bikes, um, but I, I only needed one. But um, yeah, we built a trailer and I quit my job. Um, because I worked, the, the setup costs were so minimal that if it didn't work, I, I was, I'd just get another job. So, um, yeah, we built a trailer, put it on the back of the bike. And, yeah, I'd spend my mornings uh, making bouquets and then my afternoons would be spent cycling around London delivering them. You didn't have any floristry experience at that time, did you? No, I did look into courses. And I mean, now there's loads of wonderful courses at so many different price points. But back then it was really 
you know, the main big ones that, um, that are amazing, but they're, they're for people looking to get into floristry for a career. And I only really needed to make hand tied bouquets. And so it, it seemed like to spend money I didn't have on learning how to make, you know, big floral archways or centerpieces um, just wasn't really the, the best idea. So I just watched a lot of YouTube clips and read books and, and actually the main thing is just doing it and having a go and, and knowing that it won't be great the first time around and just keep practicing. So what year was this? Can you remember? I think it was around 2013. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you were in London and you were delivering by bicycle. And I think, didn't if I remember rightly, you were giving some money away to a bee charity as well. Yeah, we still do. Yeah. Yeah. So back then it was, um, I think it was a pound per bouquet, whereas now uh, we do 5% of our overall profits. Um, and so now we also, for every 100 bouquets we send, we plant a tree. Um, oh. Yeah, it's so just just trying to, um, yeah, obviously, cut, I mean, it's a conversation we'll get to further down the line, but cut flowers aren't, aren't great for the environment. And um, we've known that from the beginning. Um, so it's just trying to do a little bit to, to ease ease that really so can we go back to the time before I want to talk more about Petalon but can I just really sort of get a better understanding of what your background was in when you say you work in sales were you yeah creative or where did what, so why suddenly the transition <laughs> well I did a degree in architecture and um, I just did my part one not my part two so I'm not a qualified architect um, but at that time, I was going for my uh, year in industry. Um, but that was right when there was a huge crash. So there, were, especially in the building sector, there were all the placements for part one students like myself were being taken by part two students and practices of 50 people were going down to 10. And every architect I met was so miserable. <laughs> so uh, especially at that time, I was like, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm cut out for this anyway. So um, I kind of just sent CVs to architectural practices and just normal jobs and all sorts. And I just did a string of very unrelated jobs. So I did a bit of concierge and I did a bit in events and then my sales. And I have to say, even though they seem all really disconnected, they've all helped me hugely in their own sure. way when it came to having my to own ask. business. Yeah. Um, and, you know, with the concierge, I had to deal with really tricky clients and uh, with events, you know, having to organize. And when I was doing weddings and stuff, that was hugely helpful. Um, and then the sales was for a company called Contagious. And they are, uh, they would hate me saying they're a trend forecasting company, but they essentially uh, help brands and um, advertising agencies with, you um, Kind of what the latest consumer trends are with kind of what technologies are available and how they should be kind of utilizing that um so you would see these really amazing examples of marketing and how small businesses and large businesses were working so i got i was selling the consultancy and i was selling they did a quarterly magazine and i, I was selling these things but i was still seeing all that content and like oh that's an amazing idea or um, and in the back of the magazine, there was a sector called Small But Perfectly Formed, where it just had small businesses that were doing um, things just perfectly, but very um, simply. And I loved that. I was like, oh, if I ever had a business, I'd love to just do like one thing well and just really like neat, easy to kind of comprehend business. And so I think when you're kind of exposed to that kind of day in, day out, and then you know, James had just started his business and it was so exciting getting wrapped up in his dream and, you know, and I helped loads with it, but you kind of want your own dream with that. So um, his, his had a huge investment, you know, he had to remortgage his flat and had to buy bicycle parts. And, you know, it was a, it was a huge thing. Whereas with mine, it wasn't, you know, if it didn't work out, I mean, I saved up my commission because I've been in sales. So I saved up enough to live off for three months. Um, really, I should have saved up a lot more. But, you know, the, the risk was, oh, OK, well, it doesn't work out. I haven't lost a huge amount of money. I had a go. I'll just go and find another job. But um, 
but it was very different for James. And, and because his took a year in planning, um, you know, he had to design the parts, get them fabricated and like all sorts of stuff. Whereas with mine, it was so quick. We actually ended up launching in the same month, um, much to everyone's protests of <laughs> being a very bad idea. But um, it was, yeah, it was hard. It was, we never competed because there's such different, I'm not very competitive like that anyway, but he had great PR and he had a great product. There were weeks where James was selling more bicycles than I was selling bouquets. And it's tough because a bouquet is a much smaller product. You know, it should be much more kind of um, fast moving, but yeah, James just had great PR at the beginning, just from a photographer just took a really beautiful picture of him making the bikes. And it, it just went from there, which is, you know, you, you can't plan for those things. Um, he had a little pop-up shop on the corner of our um, road because uh, there was a shop that had gone out of business and it was well, I think a vet was taking over from there, but just in between just had someone, but it was on a bicycle route. And so, you know, lots of people saw them as they sort of cycled through. Um, and yeah, so he, his business rocketed, whereas mine took a really long, you know, it was, it was slowly creeping up and it's, um, I tried all sorts at the beginning of sort of sending journalists bouquets and, um, and trying to kind of get the word out there. But I felt like the more I, and I didn't really have the money to be giving bouquets away like that. So I found it quite hard. And then I actually was like, I just going to concentrate on making it the best I can. And I think journalists like to sometimes feel like they've discovered you rather than being shown a product. You know, you forget how many products they get sent their way every day. I think if it's actually something they feel like, oh, I found out about this, then um, then that seemed to work a lot better. So then, then Petalon, kind of a bit more delayed, but we, we got some good PR just from actually doing a good job and just trying our hardest and... I think a lot of other kind of PR companies um, would send to journalists to say, thank you for featuring our brand. So Petalon was actually getting used without realizing it because even though they were using it for, for other reasons, um, then you, we, were, we were kind of being shown um, in front of all the journalists that I tried so hard to get the attention of in the beginning. Um, so, so yeah, so we were really... I know, you know, you can't plan for those things. But um, I think a real lesson I learned was actually just to get my head down and just work on the business and try and get it as as good as I could possibly get it. And the other stuff would follow. So we connected, first of all, back in 2013, when you very kindly made a comment on one of my Instagram posts. I was in Bath uh, at the Tallulah Rose Flower School, and I'd seen um, a bicycle on the side. They were advertising a comedy club, I think, but they had flowers on. Yeah. Them. Not real ones. But, and you commented and just went, oh, I've just set up a business in London selling bicycles. I'm sorry, bicycles. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, sort of, yeah. Bicycle. well sort of yeah yeah I remember seeing it I think god that's so strange that's in my hometown because I grew up in Bath and then uh yeah it just all seemed yeah a bit fortuitous yeah so then I featured you on Flower Rona um as an interview and then the next minute I looked around and you were writing a book <laughs> but let's talk about yeah. what, I, what I really like to talk about is your company name because I know I'm actually speaking to a college and um, training some florists on um, florist B on Monday on social media. Training. Yeah. And one of the big things that we discuss is your company name. So how did you come across the name Petalot? I know there's bicycle reference, but what made you choose that name? I mean, I'd love to say it just came to us, but we tried really hard. <laughs> I think we're just trying with a lot of um, playing on words around cycling and flowers and, you know, there, there were a lot of flowery companies and we were like something and something and it and it didn't feel quite right because it was just uh, just me. Um, and yeah, we just play with them and then, you know, obviously a Peloton and then Petal and it, you know, LON London at the end, it just all seemed to fit really so um yeah I, and I mean it's I mean I'll, we'll get on to the move to Cornwall in a bit but um it was a huge kind of 
thing to move out of London and not be able to do the bikes anymore. And I was like, it's in our name. Like, how could we ever not? But, you know, the pandemic's made us all make decisions that we didn't realise we'd have to make. So I think it's just historical and it's, you know, it's our roots. Absolutely. Oh, that's a very nice. Yeah, that's a perfect word to use for a um, <laughs> business. So when you first started Petalon, what was your... Because you, you started in a way that lots of florists haven't in that you decided you were having two bouquets, which is a concept you still keep to. What mm. made you decide on that concept? So back to when I worked at Contagious and the small but perfectly formed and certainly like a driving sort of force that I knew I wanted to have it really paired back, but, um, but actually just money as well. So I couldn't I couldn't financially afford the wastage of having leftover flowers if they didn't fit in a certain um, color palette. Um, it's really hard to gauge numbers and quantities as it is. And it just um, felt like another thing that I, I couldn't afford to, to buy that many different flowers and risk, you know, someone not liking the red bunch and then being left with loads of red flowers at the end. Um, I thought when I started out that customers would have a real problem with that and would want more choice but um we kind of skip stick to kind of the main rules that if um if so the only ones that are sort of slightly um controversial are, are white flowers like I love white flowers but they never sell as well um really? I think I'm a lot surprised. yeah I think yeah me too but I think a lot of people associate them with sympathy flowers I think a lot of people associate them with kind of like bad luck or something around death um or a lot of people just like oh my friend's just a lot more colorful than that um i think house because these bouquets are all ending up in someone's house i think it's a very different thing about what people buy to have in a house maybe than um then i first sort of realized so i mean i can do a white bouquet anyway but i'll just order much more of whatever the other bouquet will be um a lot of people are quite funny about pink they sometimes say they don't like pink so if I have a pink bouquet I'll make sure there's nothing pink in the other one um so it's just I, we tend to keep one quite subtle and one quite bright and loud or just making sure that they're different and I can honestly say I think in the years that we've been doing it maybe two people have sort of made a comment that there wasn't enough choice and all right, it doesn't really matter so yeah really like yeah shocked about that so when you say you got feedback about the colours, where how did you get that feedback? Were were you calling people up or were they commenting or sending you? No, people are lovely. You know, you'll sometimes get an unsolicited email or maybe a, a direct message or something. But um, that's good. Though. Yeah, I think once people understand. Is- it's good. yeah exactly and I, I mean in comparison we're so lucky with our customers and I mean I'll get we're in the stages of trying to get a new website up and running and um, it's just taking so much more to it than I realized but um, <laughs> one of the things that I really wanted to incorporate which is why it's taking such a long time is uh, our return rate with our customers is like that's the most flattering thing for me that someone would keep coming back to use us to send to their friends and family um, and with what's available because you know with your squarespace site or your shopify site or whatever you're using you're you're limited by what their capabilities obviously are and this is the first time that we're going for an all-out bespoke made website just for us and i was like well if we're doing it we can finally do the loyalty card i've been dreaming of so i just wanted like a coffee card stamp where you buy five food days you can get a six free just something to so, like reward people for using us and you know we really appreciate the return rate that we have so um so yeah that's going to be part of the, the new website as well which i can't can't wait for brilliant when do you think that'll be out sometime this year but you're not I sure mean, when <laughs> I know uh, how, hopefully yeah. i mean i'm always saying this hopefully next month but um yeah it just it's it was just about ready and then we realized we needed to create a new product these uh for the field flowers so um so that's being added in now yeah yeah so your names of bouquets as well. Who comes up with those? They're so cool. It's a group effort. I can't take. I can't take. Uh, I can't take that because. Um, yeah, we'll we'll t- tend to have an idea, so we'll try and think of like not necessarily current affairs, but just like okay, what's going on in the world? Is there anything? I try not to make it political, but you know anything that we can kind of use that. Um, that chimes a chord of people or, or it just might just be the color like you know this week we've got a really blue bouquet 
And she's like, wow, you've got spring, spring tides, and the other one's very blossomy. So, you know, it's, um, but yeah, no, it's certainly a group effort. Well, they're all, always very on point, <laughs> very on point. Thank you. So you initially were always delivering your bouquets by bicycle in London. Mm. Is that right? Yeah. And you, after you were doing it on your own, then you obviously had to build your team up a bit when you became more popular. How did that all work out? Um, it was definitely a gradual process. So I never quite got to the stage where I got proper burnout, but um, I was getting up at 3.30 in the morning to get down to the, I would cycle down to the flower market. Um, and, you know, you go through Vauxhall at 4, 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> not ideal um me and the clubbers you, know, you have to dodge all the broken glass because you don't want to get a puncture at that time in the morning um and then I'd fill my trailer up and cycle back to we we're in De Beauvoir and then on kind of between Hackney and Islington and um I'd make up bouquets in the morning take orders write the messages out then I'd load up the trailer and then I'd cycle around in the um in the afternoon so I think my limit on my own was about 20 but your day is starting at 3 30 a.m and then you're like not finishing till four five o'clock in the afternoon um but you can manage for about like a year but then um I, was like, I just need you know I had a cyclist for one afternoon a week and then when I had enough money two afternoons a week and then I had someone help me make the bouquets um and then when the orders were kind of increasing I couldn't fit all the like flowers from the market in the trailer so then I had to get a zip car in the mornings and then I'd go down to the market in the zip car. Then I had to get a zip van when that got too small. So it just grew kind of like that. And that makes it sound like it was just an upward curve. Like I've tried to drive the business into the ground many a time. Like it's not, it was not like it just grew and it was plain sailing, you know, because it's really hard to keep a, like, you can't do quick maths at 4 a.m. It's, you know, you're in the market trying to work out you know, oh, I need to spend this much per bouquet, that's that much per stem. And then your foliage is done by weight. So you're having to try and work out, you know, it, it it's quite tricky. And I, I ended up just spending way too much money on flowers. And, you know, suddenly, because we were doing weddings at the time, it was hard to tell that actually the flower delivery was um, like costing us money. I wasn't not making any money. I was just, I was hemorrhaging money. And so, you know, it's not until you really dissect it again, take a step back and, you know, I didn't realize that because you had money coming into the account from weddings and things. So yeah. it kind of masked that stuff. And, um, you know, it, and then we started using um, a Dutch importer. Um, I was heavily pregnant at the time. So um, I didn't have to go to the market at four o'clock in the morning and throw up in the loo down there. And, <laughs> you know, it was all the glamour. And it, it was, it was quite tough. And then, um, yeah, then suddenly I was like, oh, well, I can get, you know the, the flowers delivered to our door and it means I don't have to go to the market and when the baby comes up you know I'd have to find another solution anyway and um, so then we started using Dutch importers and yeah it did work really well for our model because I was struggling to get the amount of stems that I needed from the market because part of it is you're you're looking for see what color palette it is and you're like oh that's a lovely like lavender color I'd love to do like a lavender and apricot bunch but oh, there's only 20 stems of that campanula and I need 50. So it was starting to become a bit of a problem down at the market because our customers are buying from a picture. It has to look as close to that picture as possible. And because we, we replenish our stock throughout the week to make sure, because they're going in someone's house, they have to be as fresh as possible. So we get three deliveries from Holland a week now and we have a very intricate stock management system with our inventory so that we know you know, make sure that everyone's getting the freshest things possible because, um, yeah, you know, I'd rather send things out as close to being in bud as, as possible so that they, they, they last a long time. Well, I think it's really unusual about your bouquets as well, which makes them stick apart, like stand apart from other bouquets that you can get delivered, is that you'll very often just have one stem of something. Lots of stems. Yeah. So stems of one. What made you do, decide to do that? I think... Just to the original idea was that, I mean, we have to have some really bomb proof varieties because we have that struggle where our customers often aren't, or even just the recipients, not the customers, are people who 
their knowledge of flowers goes as far as what they can see in the supermarket. So we're constantly getting compared to either big internet, you know, letterbox flowers, or we're getting compared to supermarket flowers. And, you know, those things have been treated and they are bomb proof and they also don't make supermarkets money. So um, when that someone's kind of, whether that's their line where they're like, well, you know, my, my flowers from the supermarket lasted this long and this bouquet's only lasted that long. It means that I'm really restricted by the, like, by the flowers that we can choose. So our, the, the thing about using one stem of different things is I wanted to be able to show people, you know, you might not be able to afford a whole bunch of delphiniums, but you can have one in this bouquet <laughs> and you get to have a delphinium in your house, you know, with other stuff, but, you know, a chance to show people who might not have ever seen a delphinium because they don't stock them in Tesco's that you, you know, you, there are these wonderful flowers and okay, that might take more of my budget, but it means that I can get some other more bomb proof things that they'd probably be more familiar with, like your chrysanthemum or your carnations. Um, and I just try and get them in interesting shades or interesting shapes or, um, you know, varieties that aren't in Tesco. Um, and it's, it's just a balance really, you know, you have, I have to work to a budget at the moment. I'm sure, you know, even flower prices at the moment are eye watering and it's just a, it's just a mix of Brexit, Valentine's day, mother's day, ladies day in Eastern Europe, international women's day. April I think the prices might be a bit more normal and then you've got European Mother's Day in May so you know all these factors have a huge effect on the whole industry because you know the auction prices go up so the things that I was paying 70p a stem for they're now £1.60 it, it's like that across the board and it's not like we changed our bouquet prices so you know, the, the size of the bouquet is going to change depending on I mean we're just going over budget at the moment because you you couldn't send out a bouquet for what we would usually would at the moment. And um, yeah, you know, there, there's all these things behind the scenes. I think it looks so simple that it's just two bouquets, but um, yeah, it, it's a, uh, it's a whole web, you know, it's a beautiful swan. But then they're going underneath. <laughs> I know the feeling. So you plan your bouquet and then when do you photograph it? Do you plan it the week before? How do you do it? No, so because obviously to photograph it, I have to buy in wholesale quantities. So it would be a huge waste of money for me to be able to photograph it the week before, because then what would I do? You know, some of these things come in wrapper 50 and I can't have 50 tulips that I'm just not using or whatever. So, um, so yeah, the stock comes in from Holland on Thursday. And then as soon as it all comes in, I take the picture and then we upload the website for that afternoon. So yeah, it's always sort of been a bit, quick dash the only um exception to that is been it's only been in the last couple of years but we on valentine's day and mother's day we have to do a pre-order because obviously it's such bigger quantities and so i'll buy in to take the picture a month before um and then we do something called mystery bouquets to our subscribers where you can't see it from a picture it's a reduced price but it means that we use up all that stock that I had to buy it to take those pictures okay. so um yeah we've got a really amazing subscriber base who they're great with ideas uh, you know if we have a problem we'll often just put it in the news that and be like we're trying to work out how to do this that the other and um yeah one of our we, 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 well, I was saying earlier about the numbers and how you don't want to end up with wastage um, and the you can sometimes just sell out really early or yeah or you just over um, you sell out really early or you have loads of stock left over so one of our subscribers was like what about you know you subscribe to a list and then you just get the bouquets at cost price and so they might be a day or two older than we'd usually send out but I think if you make that clear um, so every few weeks we kind of open up the the list if um, to get new subscribers in so it's, it's really just people that are are really fans of Petalon and and you know buy flowers from us a lot anyway um, but then we get to put them on there and that gets you gets rid of all that stock so um yeah good so it sounds like you're really in touch with your customers and they are really sort of rooting for you as well and really behind. yeah yeah, it's really, it's really special and something I would never have sort of called from the beginning. But um, what I was saying earlier about how it's not just been a steady uphill um, thing from conception of the business up to, you know, 
where we are now. Um, and just before my second child was born, we um, were that kind of awkward teenage years of business where we were all set up to um, work at a much higher volume. We just didn't have that volume. And even though we were very well known in London, we weren't known across the rest of the country. So we'd started doing nationwide deliveries because we just had loads of customers like, oh, I love your bouquets. My mum would love them, but she's in Derbyshire or, you know, whatever. There was lots of people that wanted to send them to people outside of um, London. And that's how we sort of started doing the postal stuff. But I think at the time we would be doing maybe 40 on the bike and 10 in the post, say, at that time. But we just sort of invested some money into a really nice ordering system. And we had staff and everything and the space set up to be bigger. Um, and I feel like, I don't know what the past tense of wing it is, but I feel like we won it as far as we could. And then actually when it came to proper marketing and to a point where I'd actually need to pay a consultant or someone to, to come, you know, I, I feel like we'd reached our limit of what we, we were capable of. Um, but consultants cost money and we were at a point where we were actually losing money um and it just wasn't feasible so then it was kind of like well our only not our only option left but you know let's just try investment and we'd been approached by investment companies in the past and we'd always said no um and then I got back in touch with them they're like oh we're not investing in flower companies anymore so well that that's fine but I just want a bit of um just a bit of an idea of what's actually involved you know investment is something I know nothing about um and and they were amazing, actually. Jamjar, who I think were the innocent smoothie guys before they sold it to Coca-Cola. And just, you know, she's like, oh, I'll just sit down and have a coffee with you and I'll talk you through investment options. And she's like, and it was just, yeah, there are lots of lovely people who are just willing to be kind and helpful. And yeah, she sat us down um, and went through kind of what an angel investor means and what the pros and cons are, what an investment company is. And she was like, well, you're your return rate with your customers and your you know the readership you've got from newsletters seems like your customers are really um into the idea of petalon and want you guys to do well have you thought of crowdfunding and um i think i'd always thought that crowdfunding was more for startups and i don't think that's what we are anymore i, I you know we're, i think we were just a small business finding our way um but yeah we we started our crowdfunding campaign at the january last year um and just as it launched covid happened <laughs> so i mean i it's awkward asking people for money anyway but asking people for money at the beginning of a pandemic when everything's so unsure nobody knows what their job security is i was like nah i'm not up for i'm not up for that so we, we it was still live and i think there's so many legal implications with it that you can't actually you can't pull out and then put it back on again because um th there's just lots of legal stuff around it so um i was like we'll just keep it running i'm just not going to promote it um and it sort of ticked along and then actually when we had one week left um i was like well i think it's i think it's fair enough to sort of say there's a week left of our crowdfunding campaign if you're interested and we just got a, we got a huge surge of um investors and the most amazing thing was that like over 75% were women. And that's so unusual with investments. And our customers, are, I mean, about 80% of our customers are women. And um, it's women sending women flowers mainly. I mean, you get a few like romantic ones, especially the bigger that we've grown, it, it, it's not so much. But um, yeah, it, it, it's a very sort of female business in a way. Um, and yeah, it was when we talk to the investment company they're like you know it's amazing that you've got so, when you look at the sort of um, worldwide figures of of how many investors are women it, it, it's not much at all um so it felt really good and then i think as it nearly reached its target obviously the in investor platform crowdcube sort of push it out to all their um subscribers and things and then we've got loads of men who were on there anyway so it sort of brought the level down but just still you know it's fine it was investors that's great but um, yeah, it felt really good to have women who'd never invested before sending messages like, oh, I've just invested. And, you know, we had different rewards for different um, sort of amounts and stuff. And, um, and that investment was purely to be able to spend on marketing. Um, and then we haven't spent it yet. So it, 
you know, it feels great that we've got that waiting for a big marketing push when we, we need it. But um, the business just got um, busier this year and, you know, there's no point marketing it until we've got this new website finished and it's just taken forever. Um, so, yeah, it, it I, I, I don't ever want to give the impression that it started as a small business and it just got better and better and better. Like we've had some really dark times with it and we've had some amazing times with it and we've learned so many lessons along the way. Um, and yeah, 2019, like the end of 2019, we, we just we lost a lot of money um and you know doing the investment was sort of our not last ditch attempt but it was like okay let's see what this does and at that point we didn't know we'd be we knew we were moving to Cornwall but we thought the business was staying in London we didn't we didn't know we'd have to bring it down with us so let's talk about that move what was the trigger for is James from Cornwall what's the what's the um connection so um James isn't from Cornwall. He's just been to Cornwall every year of his life since he was born. So I think it's something somewhere very special to him and his family. Um, where we were living in London was a bit of a strange place where it was actually a shoot location and wedding hire venue. And then our house was on the side. So you were paying an enormous rent, but it was also a separate business as well. So even in those dark days where Petlon wasn't doing well financially, it wasn't our source of income. So even though we, it felt like it was fine because we were still able to pay staff and everything, we just weren't paying ourselves. Um, and so we had this wedding hire venue, but we were at the end of our, we had a three year lease on it. So we were just at the end of that. And we, um, yeah, we wanted to buy somewhere and just couldn't afford where we lived, you know, and um, had two small children now and a huge dog. So we wouldn't be able to, to find any way in where we were, which meant well, okay, we could maybe afford on the outskirts of London. And then at that point, it's like, well, for our job, that just doesn't work. So then um, I was desperate. I've never lived in the countryside. Um, I just wanted to wake up in beauty. I just wanted to wake up in nature. And I, I just really felt like I'd wanted that for a long time now. And I loved London. I never got to a point where I felt like I was sick of London and had to get out and it, it never got there. But I think making plans when you still love it is kind of nice. It's nice to miss it and nice to not have that kind of resentment or something that I think I've had friends that have felt. Um, so we were looking at a few properties in, in Cornwall um, kind of over the past three years. And James went to an auction down near Helston, which isn't where we are now. and um, he went, you know, took his reflective sunglasses and <laughs> paid on the face. And we didn't, yeah, we, did, we didn't get it. I think he loved bidding for it, but yeah, we didn't get it. Um, but, and I was absolutely heartbroken because I, I've never bought a house before. And I, I just thought, oh, that's our forever home. And I, I was absolutely heartbroken when we, we didn't get it. And James like, hey, there'll be another one. I'm like, there'll be nothing like that. And then, yeah, about a year later, um, James got an alert for for a property and I think it was another auction property and you kind of get like an information pack sent through um so he down you have to give your email address or something so he downloaded it to have a look but we weren't in a position to buy it and it, it just wasn't the right time and then the following week he got a phone call from the auction house and I said oh I, I saw you downloaded the the details for this property um it didn't sell at auction at the weekend so we just wondered if you were still interested and we were just on our way to Kempton Market to get some like furniture for our studio for the girls um to work on and yeah we just bought a ticket to Newquay and <laughs> And we went to Heathrow and just jumped on a little plane Seriously, and nice. yeah, yeah. And just, um, and just arranged for a babysitter to, to take clo uh, Clover. I didn't have Oshin at that time. And uh, yeah. And then we just came down here um, and it was just like Miss Honey's cottage. You know, it was so damp. It was black with mold and it was soggy. The walls were squidgy, but it had wisteria all in bloom and there was aquilegia all over the garden and bluebells. And it's just, it was, it was what you expect with an auction property where it was just like, yeah, there's no point getting a survey done because it just needs everything done. But um, it was, yeah, it was just magic. And it was like, oh, he, you know, this is, this is it. And, you know, it, 
there's the house and then it's got barns that are attached, but there weren't any roofs on them. And yeah, it was, it just had to be really. So, um, so yeah, so we got it. And because it was through an auction house, we had to kind of do a um, video call where he had the gavel <laughs> to like <laughs> say that it had been sold and it was very surreal, oh. but um, yeah. And then James just, and then I got pregnant and it's two weeks before my due date, he was down in Cornwall <laughs> up in London and he was, trying to get the you know help have builders come and help and and get the roof on and just try and make it habitable in here so we rented it out for a while while we're still in London um and then we were always going to move down in the summer but then with um then COVID got announced and and this obviously there's so many rules with restriction and it was like no no no, this isn't our second home like our we, our lease is up where we are we, we would be homeless and so there was no moving companies around or anything so we just had to have a Luton van each and I think also because I we kept it quiet for quite a while while we were down here because I didn't want to be COVID shamed it's like I, I didn't want to have to explain that you know that you know it's not our second home and we're moving down and everything's and so until we sort of found our feet with it all I just I just wanted I just also didn't want to scare our customers who are 90% were Londoners if they suddenly saw that we were in Cornwall that they would think oh we're not delivering anymore um we couldn't do the bikes then anyway because you know my cyclists weren't comfortable ringing doorbells all around London and then I wasn't comfortable with them coming back in the studio where we had you know other florists there so it seemed like the safest thing to do was to, to stop doing the bikes. And then, and then at that, and then all our staff left because everyone either went back to see their, you know, to live with their parents in the countryside or, you know, they were overseas and so they could go back home. Um, so suddenly James and I were at the helm again, which was both really hard with two toddlers, oh, one baby, one toddler. And, um, and amazing because you're suddenly like, why are we spending so much on labels? Or, you know, why is this working like that? And suddenly when you're in the thick of it again, you're just like, oh, this is, this is, you know, so you manage to save, you know, shave some money off your um, costs and stuff and try and streamline our processes or know exactly what it is that we need now. Um, and so it was both a blessing, but then when it was, so we were, the, the original plan was that we'd have our London studio still carry on we move moved the family down to Cornwall and then maybe in a year or so, maybe start growing some flowers and then we could send them up to London to be made in with the bouquets as like a vague plan. But then it's like, no, Petalon can't run without James and I being in the thick of it right now because we don't have any staff. Um, so, uh, so it just came down with us and actually that's the best thing that could have happened for it. And um yeah, we've got managed to employ florists down here who, you know, florists down here, your main work is weddings and it's um, holiday accommodation. And the two things that were not happening last year were weddings and holidays. And so, yeah, there's lo loads of florists out of work down here. And it felt really good to be able to offer some employment. Um, and yeah, it's, it, it, was, it was terrifying and amazing and hard work but it's not like we had other things you could do. You know, you can't, it was lockdown. So you just get your head down and, and work through it. I think what really has helped your customer base and the success of your business is how you've very much documented online your journey. So whether on your website, with your blog or your newsletters or your Instagram, your <laughs> you're taking people along on the ride is that an intentional thing that you're doing? yeah I think um I think because I had you know Instagram and social media before the business and there's very much you know your own personal stuff and as the business came it still had a bit bit of your personal things behind it but I think everyone's boundary with that is in a different place and uh, I think mine's changing as you know my family grows up and the business grows and I for me I think social media obviously it's a great promotional tool but uh, the bare bones of it is to like show the character behind your brand and it's um you know it's where you do get a glimpse of uh, like actually who's running it what what is it about and um yeah it, it's very hard to yeah, I think everyone has their own individual lines of like okay this is as much as I'm sharing and actually this is too personal 
Um, and yeah, I think for, for me, it's, you know, to give enough of an impression of, you know, who we are and what we're doing, but I, I do worry. I think Instagram, do, I don't fault it. I, I owe my business to Instagram, but the worry with it is obviously that everything is shiny, beautiful, bright. And obviously there are dark days and obviously my toddlers have tantrums and obviously there are days where I am just in buckets of tears and I'm worried about things but um there are Instagram accounts that are that show all that and I, I think there's certainly a place for that but this is also my shop front and I'm not prepared to uh, not air dirty laundry but I'm I try and be as realistic and transparent as possible you know and of course I'll show when a mouse has eaten a tray of you know seedlings or of course I'll show when the frost has killed half of like you know I'm learning and and it's new and it's challenging and I I have no problem sharing that but I I think that that everyone's sort of yeah line with that is in a, a different place and that's totally fine um but I would hate for the whole impression to be that it's just magical and whimsical and with it there are days where it is so magical that maybe it's too magical to put on social media because I don't want to be too smug it's too beautiful but then there are days where I am wet to my bra and I am in up in the middle of the night trying to catch the covers that have come off the crops and are up in the trees and you know, my phone isn't out then because I don't want my phone to get waterlogged again. <laughs> and then also, uh, and who's that for? You know, that, you know, there are days like that, but um, yeah, it, it's my, it's my shop front as well. So um, yeah, it's a, it's just a balance really. Mm, I think you do it really well though. I mean, I, I was saying um, to, before we came on the call, how, I love the photo that you put of Clover in the greenhouse oh, this week. So but what I really liked was your caption in that you said something like, there are, there are mornings like this. And well, what were your words exactly? Can you remember? I saw, yeah, it's mornings like this. But then I think referring back to that night in the storm where, you know, there are, there are also, yeah, I, I don't want, I think your feed is really important and it gives a sense of who you are. And there are definitely accounts that I follow that make me feel better about my feelings and, you know, that are very real. Um, and I think it's just certainly a place for that. But I think because the, I, my account, I want it to either be beautiful or funny. Like I, I want it to be an uplifting place. And of course, there are moments where you're talking about raw stuff or other things. Um, but we're a flower delivery company, really. Like that's what we are. Um, and, you know, I've chosen to share a bit about our family and I've chosen to show a bit about our kind of personal life, but um, it, it's not all on there. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the last year has been amazing, but you know, my husband had a really serious accident in the summer. And yeah, and it, really it was awful and it was terrifying. And I don't think that's something that at the time... I that I would be comfortable sharing but at the end of the year where actually he's got full functionality back now and I'm not changing bedpans <laughs> and mm. you know it it is it is it's okay then then I'm okay well uh, if I'm doing like a round robin and it's like a recap then sure but actually at the time um yeah you know he missed his kid's first birthday because he was in hospital and it was it was rubbish, but, um, but yeah, it, but you know, he, he lives to see another year. He's just not allowed to put petrol on bonfires anymore. Oh dear. I He's know. been very busy Don't. building in your, um, building a greenhouse I saw on it. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. James is my secret weapon. <laughs> he, 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 I was trying to think what his job title was the other day. I'm like, I think you're just like a service man, service manager. <laughs> just like janitor maybe. He just, I mean, he's got energy. My husband will never be seen lying on the sofa looking through his phone. He doesn't 
relax, you know, the only way he used to be able to relax when we were in London is if he would go to the cinema because he has to put his phone away. He can't work. He has, to, you know, there's no distractions. He's in the cinema. So you would often see James in the cinema at like the 11 a.m. showing or something because it's like that's time that he can just switch off. <laughs> Um, obviously, he can't do cinemas down here at the moment, but um, he 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 basically has ADHD, but in a really useful way where that energy and that nonstop um, movement just it gets plowed into projects and things that need fixing. And, you know, he, he wants to learn how to build things, plumb things. And before we came down here, he knew he would have to do lots of work like that. So he took courses in Croydon in, wow. you know, how to do micro cementing, how to do carpentry and, you know, just be able to do that kind of thing himself so that when we're down here, it would save money and he, he, he likes learning. So, um, so yeah, it, it, it's been, yeah, it's been amazing. He, he's made some beautiful stuff. He's just made a cold frame, which I'm, yeah really happy okay. with <laughs> so that's good so is he yeah in the business now then he's not doing his bicycles anymore. yeah yeah so since about january last year he's now pedal on full-time so we both used to like help each other out with different aspects and um then i think he's just he lost the love a bit with the bikes in that you're building the same thing five times a day and he never really wanted to employ people. And I think, I think it's important to talk about sizes of businesses and actually what your end um, want is from it. So I think there were family members that were like, make it bigger, make it better, make it. And he's like, I don't, I didn't get into this to employ people. You know, I got into this to build bikes. And actually now I've realized I don't want to build five of the same thing every day. So you know, he um, he sort of gradually, and then he started making bikes from scratch and and doing kind of bespoke things for a while, and he loved that. Um, but for that, you need someone to come to your workshops. You can measure them, and there's test rides, and that's just never going to work over the internet. Um, and I think he was ready. I think it felt like a good time moving to Cornwall and just closing the chapter on that. Um, I think actually his website's got a really lovely story of it all, which I haven't read for a while, so I should probably go back and read that. But um, so he's helping yeah, I think, hours. yeah, so he's in the business full time with it. So, you know, when, when COVID started, he was wrapping, he was packing, he was labels. I was helping with the floor. You know, we, we still had two florists that, you know, we knew were coming, you know, from the house in Essex, getting the car, coming here, nowhere else. Um, you just have to be so careful as an employer and it's, you know, completely unknown territory. Um, and yeah, we were suddenly doing triple the volume that we'd done before COVID because everyone was sending flowers to people they couldn't be with. So on the one hand, it was just like, we'd gone from petal on hemorrhaging money for us to suddenly, well, we're about to move out of our main money earner and petal on now actually does need to pay us. And yeah just just trying to get it up and and going and it it it's been yeah it's been an amazing year for it so um so yeah he's he's sort of full time with it now so building things growing things you know he's out there planting out 600 sign blossom <laughs> so i'm talking to you um so what's the plan with the growing can you talk to me about your new um brand field flowers which you've mentioned on yeah your website. i um it is not planned and it is not a plan <laughs> it is a <laughs> kind of knee-jerk reaction to realizing so i thought the main idea when we were like well we should if you can't move to the countryside and not grow so um so we moved down in the beginning of may last year and then our poly tunnels were constructed in the beginning of the july but that's too late in the season really to be growing anything. And, you know, we start to prep the ground and everything. So last year we bought um, a few chrysanthemum plugs and we're like, well, we just want to see what we learn from it um, and work out everything with Petlon is a game of numbers. It is a huge maths thing because you're trying to predict how busy you think you're going to be each week. So um, the spring and the summer, uh, well spring's still pretty good but summer and early autumn our sales go right down because a lot of people are on holiday 
So I think a lot of people are worried to send flowers to someone because they're like, oh, are they going to be there? Or, you know, so our, our sales every year dip down in the summer. But, you know, when we were doing weddings, it would kind of take the edge off that. Um, so it's something you have to keep in a, to mind with numbers. And so and because we've grown a lot in the last year, um, the plan was to put one stem of a homegrown flower in each bouquet but trying to work out how many to plant is one thing and then actually you know i've not grown flowers before it's not like they all come up at the same time and there's loads of flowers you know you have that kind of peaks and troughs and you have a flush and so it's like well what do we do with those you know i've got 50 ranunculus that i could sell but i actually need 300 so how, what do I do with those, you know, those 50 ranunculus? It's all very well me sending some to my mum in the post, but that's not a long-term solution. Um, and I was getting quite stressed about, um, so I killed loads of zinnias that it turns out I planted too soon. And a mouse ate half a tray of cat and anch. And, you know, I left my um, foxgloves on the heat bench too long. And so they scorched in the middle. You know, I, I keep reminding myself that this year is just a trial. I've just talked about our failures. There's some stuff that's been great, but like, you know, it's the, the, the thing that was keeping me up at night was like, well, we, we haven't reached that 300 stems. We're not going to be able to get those. And, you know, some of the flowers that we're planting will have several flowers per plant and some of them just have one. So uh, there were so many variables with it and I was just getting quite panicked about um how busy we were with petal on which was a it, what a problem to have you know I'm selling too many bouquets I can't you know it it's amazing um but that's really because there's just been Mother's Day you know Mother's Day and Valentine's Day is in a really realistic um sort of time period but it it was kind of worrying that you know once we do do this marketing push if that works and we get more sales then I I can't say, oh, well, some of the bouquets have flowers that we've grown and some of them don't. And, you know, people are ordering from a picture. It has to look like that picture. Um, and then, yeah, we just we just sort of thought about a chef special kind of board. And, you know, you pick what's, what's looking great in the field. It's not like you can book ahead with it. You can't book a future date. It's like this is next day delivery. Maybe, like, you could do next day, day after and um you know there'll be a box where you can have mixed warm colors mixed cool colors or you know mixed brights or you just have one maybe we had a bumper crop of um, rudabecchia so you have you know a box of rudabecchia or it it just very much a changing menu that's kind of fast moving that shows the seasonality but then you might be able to get your hands on flowers that they don't they don't sell on the auction, you know? So there's stuff that I know that when I was a florist, I was desperate to get my hands on Sahara Rudabecchia. Like, have you seen that? It's amazing. But, you know, they don't do it at the auction. You, I think I've seen one bucket of it maybe at the market. And, um, you know, it, it, it's stuff like that that gets florists excited. And, you know, you want to be able to show people that might not be so familiar with it all these cool flowers that you know you might not even know existed so um it's so exciting to be able to grow all that stuff and this year's just a trial you know they might not travel well they might you know it might not work but i feel they that might. i try and they might exactly they might <laughs> thank you rona they might but um the one thing that i find lacks with our bouquets is i can't find enough throughout the year that smells good so like there are obviously some roses that are beautifully scented but they're too expensive for us or you know I try and get two burrows where I can but I I think the the joy of you growing your own flowers is if I can get it that you open up this box and you know you're hit by you know geranium leaf and mint and you know other exciting things that would be that would be amazing so the the field flowers was basically a panic in the night we're never going to be able to grow the right quantity of flowers. I can't live with myself if we have to throw stuff away or just get, I can't just give it away. It's, it's taken too much of my time to grow them all. And I know that it's something that people want. And I think it was just, I just had to find the right idea to be able to offer it. And, uh, and I think, I think it's going to, I think it's going to be great. We've had such lovely feedback from our customers who are so excited 
and I know I'm that if I, 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 oh. I think, pers- you know, because I haven't been to the market for mm. a very long time and yeah. I'm really, and I've got a few flowers in my garden, but I'm not a grower and I've been yeah. buying flowers online just to have flowers and, and I've yeah. got some orders and they've been really nice flowers, but are the same flowers every week and I'm, you know, same yeah. type of flowers or every two weeks That's and, it. and I just... I think the fact that you'll have flowers that you won't know what you're going to get the next, you know, it will, there'll be yeah. that mystery. And also just, just to, I think the whole flowers in your home thing is going to get bigger just for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think before, so the petal on bouquets are very much a gift bouquet. Like we do have subscribers um, and they, they're, Great. And a lot of our subscriptions are maybe if um, your friend has moved into a new house, someone will get them a subscription for a month's worth of our lovely. flowers or something. Oh, yeah. Pe- like people are lovely. Like this is the thing is we've got a database of like thousands of such lovely messages. Obviously, GDPR, I can't do anything with it. No, but, no, no, no. you know, there's just like you're like, God, I'm an awful friend. These people are such good friends. <laughs> They're so lovely to their friends and they're so thoughtful. And um, yeah, people like, especially like this year has been hard and yeah, a lot of, a lot of love on um, that we, you know, are packaging up every day. And I, I, I never take that for granted. And, you know, now that I am not seeing every bouquet that goes out, I'm not certainly not making it. I'm not packing it anymore. And we've got amazing studio staff down here. But the one thing I say to them is like, if you were sending it to your mum, would you be happy if you saw that on the table to make sure that that quality and everything, just to make sure that each bunch is special because that's how, that's how the business grows because your customer is different to your recipient. And I know that this year has been so hard for event florists and wedding florists and, you know, people are doing delivery bouquets where they can and it's just it's really hard especially when it's not your main thing um so yeah I just I just think everyone's done brilliantly this year Mm. and yeah I'm just in awe of everyone so let's talk about Florence's three tips before we finish (laughs) (laughs) oh I hope they're useful I'm sure they will um (laughs) <laughs> so uh last was it last year no year before last the um I signed up to a course at the British Library which was really useful um it was the innovation for growth course and it's totally free EU funded um you have to like match certain criteria with it but um it's what I was saying where I, I felt like I'd done everything I could and that actually I needed some external input and it's great you get some mentoring with an IP lawyer you get mentoring with branding and lots of other stuff this isn't a plug for that it was just um I, it was oh, it was nice. great um and there was one thing that stuck out for me so much that I, I mean this course was weeks long I can't believe it's only the one thing but it was that you obviously time management is a struggle for everyone I'm awful at time management but what I am much clearer on which has really helped especially actually when you're self-employed I think when it's just you um, and it's hard because you can't delegate as much um, is that you separate some time aside every day or you know you, you just make sure you have it in your calendar that you're either working on the business or in the business so you're working in the bit, you know, often I'll find myself suddenly sweeping the barn or, you know, making up a few bouquets and that's very much working in the business. And I'm putting off some of the bigger overarching arching things of working on the business. And that I found really helpful where I'm setting time aside and not feeling guilty for not doing the, the kind of day in, day out work and actually setting time aside, even if, that time is just daydreaming and thinking about how something might work or if it's revisiting um I haven't got a business plan but if I had a business plan maybe revisiting that or you know things that aren't your day in day out tasks but things that just give you a bit more focus and make you feel less panicked about the direction that you're kind of going in because we've all had to tack and change direction Mm -hmm. in the last year 
and our businesses will all look very different. And next year, I think I don't think we've seen the repercussions of what's going to happen. I think it's going to keep changing. And I think it's actually having the confidence in yourself to like set that time aside, step back and be able to um, be flexible and actually be like, okay, it's not so bad. Like if you had told me two years ago, we weren't going to be delivering by bike, I'd be like, oh my God, but our whole thing is same day delivery. Like that was our big thing that you could order by 12. No one's going to order with us if we're not same day. And it was fine. And it's, it, you know, you, I didn't know that until we did it. You can't plan for that. No one can plan for a pandemic, but it's, um, it's, yeah, setting that time aside basically to, to, to give yourself that grace and, and be able to, to sort of be a, more equipped to be flexible. So when you say every day, have you sort of set like half an hour in your diary every day? How have you f- physically done it? Yeah, I, uh, so my, there's me and James, but then also we've got um, Becky as well, who um, is amazing. And she is so organized and incredible. And she's in Anglesey now. So uh, we have to, yeah, we have to do calls every day and talk to each other. But actually that makes us talk about the more business sort of side of things and how things are going to go. And so, you know, planning field flowers has been a huge part of that and there's so much that goes into it you wouldn't know that maybe there's been a huge cardboard shortage over the last year because everyone's doing online deliveries so you know there's been stuff about you know the lead time of being able to get cardboard these boxes I'm like well all my flowers would have bloomed by then so trying to find a different solutions to that and you know just 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 trying to work out how that product is going to sit within the rest of our stuff you know once it's you have I think that you have to be really transparent. I would hate to ever be accused of being greenwashing. You know, I'm very aware that our bouquets are imported and I don't ever want to muddle our customers, especially ones that don't know much about flowers. They'll see pictures of the polytunnels and say, oh, these bouquets are grown in Cornwall. And it's like, no, 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 no. It's being able to be transparent about this is an imported bouquet. We are growing some of our own stuff and that is a separate product. And it's just trying to do that in a way which doesn't make it sound apologetic. Like, I don't want to be apologetic about using imported flowers. Like, I know that there are ups and, you know, there are pros and cons to it. And obviously the cons are huge and there are environmental ones. And we try and make up for that in different ways. But it does, it would be lovely to grow locally and sell locally, but that isn't an option for everyone. You know, if you want British flowers and you live in a high rise in Birmingham, how, you know, that it's just not feasible. So, you know, we we aren't perfect at all and um i just trying to do the best we can by being imperfect still giving the customers all the information that they need and i hope in time we create a platform where there is more awareness about british flowers and you know i hope to pair up with other growers um i mean speaking to susie at picked at dawn and i'm really hopeful that we'll be able to do a british bouquet in july together um and yeah and and be able to give Susie a platform on our website to kind of show where we can do I mean she's really up for it and and so am I and you know if you can get the flowers to us and she's growing you know she's planted seeds for it and everything but my I thought it'd be great to have you know the Cornish collective and you'd loads of growers down here but everyone that I've approached are too busy with their own things and so yeah it's it's, a, it's an opportunity to be able to really amplify British flowers. And I don't want the fact that we're not perfect to get in the way of doing something good. And there's obviously been a lot of chat, especially around Mother's Day about British grown flowers. And obviously it's hard because there aren't that many around in February and you know you can have subscriptions and things instead. But um, yeah, I just, I think if you're transparent about what you're doing and the options that are available and letting the customer decide, we, we've got a chance to really be able to boost British flowers. And I, and I, and I, hope, and I hope it goes that way. Well, I'm glad to hear you're uh, taking that tack and going to be one of the British flowers ambassadors moving forward and growing them. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. What's number two, Florence? Okay, number two is, um, I think, especially when you're a small business or on your own, um, you feel like 
I don't know whether growing up you would ever at school be told, oh, well, you're not you're not good at art. So then you just don't do any drawing because you're like, oh, I'm not creative. And I, I hate the word creative. I hate that someone is a creative or they're not a creative. I think it's so um, it's got so many. I think it's it's interesting with with my husband, James. So he was always told he couldn't draw, couldn't be creative. He's so creative, but in ways that, you know, aren't drawing a beautiful portrait you know he's made beautiful things out of wood or you know he's creative in his thinking and uh my sorry I'm waffling but my no, no, sort of no. point it, is it's really important as I feel very passionate about that word as well as in yeah I was told I wasn't creative and I was like oh, maybe I'm not <laughs> yeah exactly and I think it and it, I think it can be really damaging especially in your own self-worth and what you're capable of and so I, I, I felt like the business was at a size where I was like, oh my goodness, I can afford to pay for someone to do some artwork. That's so exciting. And I got really excited about approaching an artist and I wanted to get um, some amazing like prints done and stuff. And, um, and it just, it didn't really work out um, in terms of like the times that we needed it and what we sort of wanted. And I, I think because we needed something quite quickly. And then I just, I mean, I know it all meant to hate Amazon, but I bought a lino printing set online, came the next day, had a go. And I was like, do you know what? Actually, I like this. Like it wasn't, it wasn't the beautiful, and obviously the professionals are there for a reason. And it was by no means like, what I had envisaged that this artist would have been able to do for us but it looked totally different but I was like yeah, I quite like this this will do this is fine and I think my point is don't be afraid to to tackle those areas where you feel like it doesn't have to be creative but those areas that you feel that you're are not your strong points like I was like oh I'm just not really good with technology and so I'd often shy away from doing website related stuff when actually you can Google anything. So if you're really stuck on Squarespace and you can't get something to line up with another, just Google it. Cause someone had that problem. There's a YouTube clip. Okay. So it might take an hour of your time to like watch the clip and try and do it. But I think this idea that you you need, you know, you need an accountant. No, you don't. You can have accounting software. You need a web developer. No, you don't. There's Squarespace. You know, all these things that um, that you think, oh, you need a professional to do this. Okay, of course, there are some areas where you maybe do, but give yourself some credit and just have a go. It might be rubbish, but you might have learned something about code or you might have learned something about photoshop or whatever that you didn't know before so that's my second that's point really really it was you, the lino print is that your field flowers for the box yeah yeah, ah, yeah. Site. yeah so um well done. yeah it's lovely i mean a child might have been able to do it but i think for the look and feel of it, it it's fine yeah, yeah. um and yeah, and then you know, I did our logo. I wanted to get all the logos done for the new website, and I ended up doing it in a felt tip pen, and it actually works fine. So, you know, it's just um, it. Of course, if I got an artist to do it, it would be another level up. But I'm just saying, it. it if you're pressed for time or pressed for money, don't be afraid to, to have a go at things that you might think are only you know for someone who's that is. You know, it's um. We have lots it's, of hats it's being small business owners, don't we? <laughs> lots of That's hats. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so what's um, three? Uh, okay, so this is one that my husband has said to me a lot over the years when I've been with Petalon. So uh, we've had our fair share of copycats throughout the um, time that we've been doing it, which is it's fine. You know, that's part of it, but. I think, well, in the days where I was getting up at 3.30, I had put my all into it. And then someone just sees your website and like, oh, that's a good idea. And then just lift all the copy, the B donations, everything. And it used, and I, it's not like I had the money to spend on lawyers and I'm not even sure that's a route I would ever want to go down, but it's just the hurt. Like, you're like, I... I tried so hard with that and then someone's I it, it really used to bother me and I got very upset one morning and um 
James just looked at me and said, like, you've just got to be more like the All Blacks. I was like, excuse me, he loves, he, he loves rugby. He's an absolute rugby, I think, growing up in Bath, you can't not. And uh, I was like, what, what, what do you mean? He's just like, the All Blacks just never look at their competition. They don't worry themselves with statistics or how well anyone else is doing. They just concentrate on their own game and being the best that they can be. Be more All Blacks. I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, you know, and I, and I, have, I have just tried really hard not to worry about if we have copycats, they have all gone out of business now. And if, you know, I just try not to, it's very hard with Instagram not to compare yourself to other people, especially with creative work. And I think sometimes it's good to take a bit of a break or to actually just mute some of those accounts that you, that you just have to take a step and be like, is this making me feel good about myself and my capabilities? And is it inspiring me? Or is it actually just making me compare myself? And so I think there's a really fine line and it's just being aware about where your boundary is with it. But um, yeah, I, um, I don't bother myself with what other flower delivery companies are doing. And so I think when we did that, I did that course at the British Library, there's a lot of questions about your competitors. And I was like, I don't know. And I know I probably should know, but I, I know I don't want to be like them. And I know what I want. I want this company to be. And um yeah just be more all blacks and just concentrate on you because also if you find yourself imitating someone else you're only ever going to be as good as something that someone's already done and it's that doesn't serve anyone so um so yeah that is such a lovely analogy and i'm going to <laughs> say thank you very much james really 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 good because yeah it is i think um, I'll never forget the um, very lovely florist Shane Connolly once said to me um, that when he started up over 25 years ago, the only way you could compare yourself to another florist was if they wrote a book, you know, and that wasn't very common back then. But nowadays, yeah. with the internet, you've got websites and you've got social media and and there is a chance that you can compare yourself so much more. And, you know, we all have different ways of, coping with comparison and I try yeah. by thinking well how is this helping me as in what can I how can I benefit from seeing what what's there exactly than, oh they've done that and I should have done that you know but it's, it's, yeah it's taken a long time to get there you know it's yeah it's, yeah so all blacks yeah right exactly yeah <laughs> thank you so so much florence for sharing no worries amazing story and i'm so sorry if i've waffled on <laughs> no i have so enjoyed listening to you and i'm okay. sure my listeners will love all the nuggets of amazing advice you've given all the way through and i think you know, you're very, very transparent on your website. Um, oh, with your thank blog. you. You are completely transparent with what your product is and what your aims are. And I've no, no, really don't think you're greenwashing at all. You're very, very, <laughs> very, you couldn't be more transparent, I don't think. Um, and I love that you're sharing your journey and I very much hope that you're, 2021 has um lots of more positives happening in it i'm sure it yeah will. i can't wait to see Thank how you. the growing side turns out i'm so excited i think i can finally get my head around that there'll be like color in the field we've just got the first ranunculus and then is coming up and yeah you're like oh i can see i can see now that this is gonna this is gonna be full of color soon so yeah i can't wait very exciting very exciting and and i know there's masses and masses of hard work that goes into running your business and you've also got a very physical side to what you're doing with all the growing as well so it, yeah it's um i think you're doing an amazing job oh thanks Verena. so have a lovely rest of your day and thank you so thank much you. for your time oh thank you so much for asking me on it's been a pleasure so I hope you enjoyed my interview with Florence. It was so lovely to catch up with her and hear about all her adventures in Cornwall. And um, she really is great at keeping it real. Um, she's very passionate about bringing flowers 
to more and more people and especially more and more beautiful new varieties that they might not have seen before and also championing British flowers. I wish her and her husband James and their two little ones all the very best for the coming year and can't wait to see how it pans out, especially with field flowers. So thank you so much Florence for sharing all your wonderful tips. I'll see you next week.